Welcome to the Hockey Show. My name is Roy Bellamy. David Drunk in the Hockey News is right there. There he is. We have Bruce Boudreau today. Uh, we also have Paul Lucas of UniWatch. Uh, this is why we are wearing jerseys right now. But before we get to that, we will talk about the Florida Panthers. Well, quick recap. Now, this week, the Panthers had one of those epic comebacks that yeah. reminded you of the season prior, which they won the President's Trophy. They won 4-3 after scoring four unanswered goals, three in the third period against the Dallas Stars, David. That was fun. That, that was, was fun. It was definitely a throwback type of win. It's not the way Florida wants to play at all. You don't see them falling behind very often, let alone falling behind by three goals. Right. Uh, but that just goes to show, and you know, it's what Paul Maurice has said kind of over the last couple of months, is they look for ways to play their game and to win games in different ways. And that was a game where you know it's not ideal, but you're going to run into situations like that potentially in the playoffs. And they showed they can go on the road, they can withstand that kind of a storm, come back and win. The uh, power play was excellent in that game, and Sergei Bobrovsky kept them in that game. Two of the three goals they gave up was not his fault. Um, but, you know, his defense has has to do a better job in front of him. I know it was a road trip. I know they're tired. I know they came in injured. But they got to do a better job there. Yeah, well, that's kind of been the, a big part of Bob's success this year, why he's having such a strong season, is how well they've played in front of him, how they're cleaning up rebounds, second chance and third chance opportunities are getting wiped out of the slot, because that's things that would beat Bob in the past. His rebound control has always been kind of, you know, not his best element of his game. Yeah, it's been iffy. But the defense in front of him, just like what it was in Columbus when he was putting up those great numbers there, he's getting great defense in South Florida now. And as long as that continues, it, this week it was a little if flimsy, but as long as that continues on the whole, uh, Bob and the Panthers will be all right. Aaron Ekblad is hurt. He's going to be out two weeks. Evan Rodriguez is day-to-day. Both of them did not play at Dallas. We saw Josh Maher, and we saw Kyle Pozo, who we just picked up at the deadline. That's right. Go over their games on Saturday, on, on, on Tuesday. Kyle Pozo uh, plays a very strong, responsible game. Paul Maurice was raving afterwards about how smart he was, how he was engaging on the bench, how he understood the team didn't have it early on, and he just played a very controlled game and basically gave the Panthers what they needed. And that's really why you bring in a guy like Kyle Ekposo, a veteran. He's been to the playoffs. He knows what Florida's trying to do. So, yeah, it's going to be a good fit, I think, with him. And in terms of Josh Maher, like, this is just a chance for guys to step up the way they did the first 15 games of the year when Ekblad and Montour were out. You had Mahura stepping in. You had back then Uvis Belinskis played a really good role for the Panthers. And Avler ekman Larson, he's back up on the top pairing. And uh, the Panthers, you know, this is why they have the depth they have, because for situations like this, you want to be able to maintain. Last night they played the Carolina Hurricanes. They lost 4 to nothing. Sam Bennett got hurt, so he didn't play either. They put Jonah Gajevich into the lineup to beef up. And they did play physically. There were a lot of hits in that game from the Panthers. They had 37 themselves. But I guess that didn't go. That didn't really go too well against the Carolina Hurricanes. Yeah, that, that's kind of a trademark. You'll see the team that hits more generally doesn't have the puck as much. So it's something to keep, you know, I, I don't want to say keep an eye on. But it's, it's usually kind of a, a symptom of what happens. But with the Panthers, this is two straight games now where they've gone to Carolina and they haven't gotten a goal. The first one, uh, Peter Kachetkov was amazing. That 45-save shutout. Last night, the Panthers only had, I think, 20-something shots on goal, one of their lowest outputs of the season. So, you know, Paul Maurice, after the game, kind of threw it as a one-off, that he's not worried that it's going to continue. But now they go into this game on Saturday against Tampa, and you know Tampa's going to be pissed because Florida put up a nine spot the last time they played against them. All right, now joining us is former NHL coach and current NHL Network analyst Bruce Boudreau. Uh, We just came off of the trade deadline, and I just want to know from you, what do you believe is the best move that went down during the trade deadline? Well, I mean, I think there was uh, a few good moves, but I think uh, the one that, to me, that's going to prove to be the best is is Carolina getting Kuznetsov and Gensel. I think it uh, adds to their second line and gives them a bona fide threat um, other than Aho and company. And I think that's what's... Uh, you know, that's what's going to make it difficult for teams like Florida, um, more difficult. I still think Florida's the best team, but uh, uh, I, I, I think that Carolina made significant grounds in catching them when it comes uh, to playoff time. Yeah, they did kind of prove that last night as Kuznetsov scored in the uh, 4 nothing win against the Panthers. Um, what did you think about that game? What was your takeaways from the Hur- Hurricanes-Panthers game? Well, the, the one thing, I think that the, the Panthers are already in playoff mode. And then, I mean, they allowed one goal against the Rangers. I mean, uh, they shut out uh, somebody last week, one nothing. They, they uh, you know, they 
win for nothing last night. They're they're in playoff mode right now. Whether that's too early to get into that mode, I don't know, because um, you can only last so long playing that that well. But uh, uh, they're going to be they're going to be what I saw is like Florida has been playing very good against everybody. I thought the and even that game last night was not a for nothing uh, game to me. But at the same time, I think that uh, uh, it, they're going to be a significant challenge this year. And if they do end up playing the Panthers, I mean, they're going to readily know that uh, uh, the Panthers beat them four straight last year, even though Mr. <laughs> Brindamore refuses to admit it. <laughs> now, you, when you talk about playing a playoff style... <laughs> You all right over there? I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about that aspect for months now. Yeah. How could he – how? Why would he say that? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've lost four straight, and I wish I could have went back and told my owners it wasn't really four straight. Uh, you got the playoff dates for those extra two games that uh, – oh, you didn't get the money for those two playoff games extra? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> let me figure that one out. So when talking about the Panthers and playoff hockey, because I know you said it's hard to play that high level of intensity, but that's kind of what Paul Maurice's crew has been doing from from day one, really, this season. So from a coaching standpoint, when you look at the Panthers and you approach playing the Panthers, if you're playing them in the first round of the playoffs, how do you what, like what's the message to your team? How do you approach a team that just comes at you the way that the Panthers do? Well, I mean, it, it's a difficult thing. I mean, uh, because the Panthers can dictate and uh, how to play. Uh, they got one of the better penalty killers, uh, penalty killing teams in the league. I think they're in the top ten. They got one of the best power plays in the league. Um, so I mean, they're they're going to dictate which you know they want a physical game. That's the way they're going to play, and uh, that's why they went out and got Tarasenko, and they got a little bit more depth uh, and uh, on their team right now, and because they knew they by playing that way, which is playoff hockey, is that they ran into trouble against Vegas because they didn't have any, enough manpower left. Uh, uh, and I think they're going to be able to ramp it up. I think they're just playing the way they're playing right now. They don't have Bennett in the lineup. Uh, uh, and when he gets there, he's a physical He's a physical player. He didn't play last night anyway. And uh, so, I mean, they're, and there's, they're missing a couple other guys too. So, I mean, it's uh, – I'm not – the one thing I'm not worried about is Florida. I've picked them to come out of the East, and I still think they're the best team to come out, to come out of the East, no matter who has made uh, any kind of progress in their uh, uh, at the trade deadline. Nice. We uh, mentioned Rod Brindamore, obviously, and uh, Paul Maurice is currently coaching the Florida Panthers to top spot in the National Hockey League right now. Who do you see will win the Jack Adams Award this year for Coach of the Year? Oh, it's it's interesting. I mean, because that that um, that award is usually given to a team to a coach that uh, uh, th- that a team isn't expected to be good. Now, the reason I don't think Paul's going to win it is is because everybody expected Florida to be where they are, so he's doing what they're doing. Uh, the the like I think um, myself is like Vancouver wasn't pick to to be where they are and Rick talk it's done a really good job uh, in getting them to where they are uh right now so he's going to be the front runner edmonton uh if they were ever to uh overtake vancouver i think uh, he would he would win it i mean that's when i won it in 2007 it was because of our team when i took over the team it even didn't coach the whole year there uh but I mean, they were in last place, and they moved from last to first. So uh, I think that that has a big thing in the in the in the voters' minds. Like that is doing things you're not supposed to. Like even like if Philadelphia was to make the playoffs, nobody thought they would make it. Tortorella would have a shot. I think Rick Bonus in Winnipeg, even though they had a good team, would be sentimental to uh, uh, be a spot in there because he's he's been coaching for so long and hasn't had an opportunity uh to coach a team for a full year as good as winnipeg is so those are i mean there's a lot of good coaches in the league a lot of good a lot of good things done in this league it's a hard it's a hard thing to win but i just think the voters look for that special thing i mean last year um they gave it to um to boston's coach uh because i mean they had a record-breaking year yeah, and uh, 
so, I mean, you couldn't deny that. No matter what anybody else did that was good, you couldn't deny that what he did. So, I mean, he got it, he got it. But this year, I think they'll give it to somebody who that team wasn't expected to be that good, and they are that good, and this is how they'll, what, they'll do it. So, Bruce, one of the guys you mentioned as Jack Adams' candidate was uh, John Tortorella. I wanted to ask you about what happened with Torts last week when uh, he got a little upset when the Flyers were playing the Lightning, refused to leave the bench. It was kind of hilarious from my perspective, uh, no disrespect. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get your take on what happened and what you thought transpired. Well, you know, John's excitable. Um, and I think what he was trying to do was just to get the referee's attention to come on over to him. Yep. And uh, that that was the big thing. And so he wasn't, he was saying, I'm not leaving the bench on, until, uh, un, until you come over and talk to me. And Wes wasn't coming over and talking to him. And so that was, that was. <laughs> That was the thing he was getting. <laughs> and when referees don't do that, I'm telling you, as a coach, all it does, it makes the coach matter because they just want to talk to him. And yet they go further away. And so then the coach starts having to yell right across the ice to him. And then it gets louder and then things get heated. And that's why things happen. I want to take you down memory memory lane right now. Uh, Ten years ago, when you were coaching the Ducks, you were playing the Avalanche. And that game got out of control. And Patrick Roy, who was the head coach of the Avalanche at that time, also got out of control. He went towards you, and there was just one divider. There wasn't like a well for like a, a reporter or a cameraman. Then it was one divider, and Patrick Roy shoved the divider towards your direction. What was going through your mind during that altercation? I was going, "Please hold up, please." <laughs> <laughs> We like, I mean, you, you know, Patrick's a pretty big guy, and I knew he was a uh, a rough and tumble kind of goalie, and that had gotten into scraps before. But um, uh, I looked at him, and I couldn't see his eyes; they had rolled back in his head, so I knew he was he had lost it a little bit. And that was his first game, quite frankly, as an NHL coach, too. Wow! And and they had won the game. The game was over. I mean, they had won six to one, and. What had happened is I think he wanted to send a message and he put his tough guys out there and they started a little fight. And then he came to the bench and he was chirping, uh, chirping the players on the ice. And uh, Corey Perry, <laughs> who always gets by the boards there, he had a water bottle and he was squirting Patrick in the face. And I think that, <laughs> that uh, just wound him up. And oh, he no. came after me because I didn't even know what was going on, quite frankly. <laughs> and then my assistant coach said, uh, uh, Bruce, uh, Patrick is screaming at you and I and then I just automatically just started protecting my players and started screaming back at him but when the glass almost came down I said please stay up glass please stay up <laughs> uh finally you said the Panthers are coming out of the east who is coming out of the west and who will win the Stanley Cup final Oof. oh I wish I had the that that answer I'd be in Vegas right now but I mean uh, I could um, be Vegas again I, the, 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 I think it could be Vegas, not the way they're playing. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, if I'm Vegas right now, I'm worried more about making the playoffs than I am um, winning the Stanley Cup at this stage. But uh, I think I, I, good teams and Dallas isn't playing very well either. So, I mean, uh, uh, Vancouver's been really steady, even though I think when it comes to the playoff time, uh, there's going to be better teams. I think Edmonton is poised. And you've seen them being able to go on long runs, and they're playing much better defensively this year. I think they've got a really good chance at uh, at winning the West um, this year. I mean, the biggest thing uh, out of the teams in the East and the West is getting out of that first round. There's going to be some upsets, mm -hmm. I think, and getting out of that first round. But I think I think it, it it'll end up Edmonton and Florida um, uh, in in the finals. You can catch him on NHL Network. Bruce Boudreau, we appreciate you joining us today. No problem. My pleasure, guys. All right, joining us now is Paul Lucas of UniWatch. Uh, it is one of my favorite sites, uh, but unfortunately for me, Paul is leaving the site on, on May 26th. Um, like, I've been following UniWatch for a very long time, uh, back when Paul was still working for ESPN, actually, and he's done an incredible job of informing the public 
what exactly is going on, not only with uniforms, but with court and rink and field designs. Yep. It, it's in we're watching an error in right now with uh, with Paul leaving. So, uh, Paul, we are very happy that you are joining us, and we are sad to see you leave. Um, but well, I uh, I have mixed feelings about it myself, but uh, <laughs> yeah, the, day, the day I'm leaving, that date you mentioned, May 26, that's that's Unique Watch's 25th anniversary, the 25 years since the very first Unique Watch wow. columns published, and so you know it's a long time to be doing the same thing, and so I just feel like it's time for a change. That is that that's amazing. 25 years of doing this is just wow. Like we've been doing the radio show for 20 years. I mean, that's a long time. But 25 years of covering sports. Let alone sports jersey, but covering sports like yeah. that, that is a very long time. Uh, and we're going to start off because we are a hockey show. We're going to start off with hockey uniforms. Uh, right now, Dave is wearing a Edmonton Oilers jersey. I'm wearing a Chicago Blackhawks jersey right now. Uh, what would you say is your favorite hockey jersey of all time? Of all time. Um, I like a lot of, uh, sort of old school fans. I, I like the original six, most of the original six teams. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up as a Rangers fan. I still love uh, the Rangers home jo- or what I think. <laughs> you know, I just slipped there and said home. I mean the white <laughs> uniform, which because I, when I was growing up, yeah. that was the home uniform. Yeah. And to me, almost every NHL team looks better in white yes. than in color. I think most NHL uh, teams, their white uniform is superior to their colored uniform. I wish they would go back to white at home instead of color at home. Uh, they made that change in 2003. But I do love the Rangers. Of course, the Rangers uh, uniforms are a little different than most N- uh, NHL teams because they don't have a single crest. They have that mm-hmm. diagonal lettering. But I also love the Canadians uniforms. I love the Red Wings uniforms. For some of the more modern teams, uh, I do like the Sharks. I do like the Hurricanes. Um, there's some other teams. I mean, in general, I th- oh, I, I, I should give a special shout out to the Wild. I think the Wild in general have had a very good uniform program and visual program throughout their history. They are probably of the the sort of more modern, uh, like third wave of, of contemporary teams. They are probably the best looking team in in my estimation. Uh, and you know, writing about hockey uniforms as opposed to to other sports, I always say hockey uniforms are the most interesting because. Uh, as a designer, if you're designing a hockey uniform, you have the biggest canvas to work with because almost every part of the hockey player is, is covered by some aspect of the uniform. Basically, everything except his face. And that's not the case in any other sport. Uh, hockey uniforms also uh, are the only of uh, the major sports, uh, the only ones where the jersey is designed to be worn untucked. So you have that extra bit of lower jersey area to to work with, and that's how we get those great belly stripes that that so many teams have. Yeah, um, hockey has clung to this notion of of short pants. It's really a very unusual uniform style, uh, and there's no other sport like it. And it's and and hockey on. I'll keep going. Unlike some other sports, like in football and basketball, you don't have to have a number on the front, so that doesn't eat up some of the front real estate. And the designer has more room to play around with that crest uh, on the front of the jersey. And so uh, I feel like hockey has generally has the most interesting uniforms of all the major sports. Now, Paul, following your work over the years, I've always kind of imagined you as kind of having a open your closet and all you see is jerseys. Like, you know, a lawyer opens his closet and it's just suit, 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 suit. So I imagine you've got either a closet or a room, perhaps, because some guys have their shoe room, where it's just jerseys as far as the eye can see. Uh, how many jerseys do you actually own and how often do you wear them? I actually own almost no jerseys. People are often surprised wow. to hear that. Wow. Uh, I, I, so I'm, I'm about to turn 60 years old. I'm an old guy. I'm literally a gray beard, as you can see. So I grew up in the 70s. At a time when you couldn't buy a jersey, even if you wanted to, that market didn't yet exist. Uh, and so I never really associated being a fan with wearing the team's jersey. I was interested in uniforms, but I didn't necessarily want to dress like the players. Uh, I do own a decent number, like two dozen maybe, of old uh, like vintage baseball jerseys and mm-hmm. some uh, basketball warm-up tops. Um, all from like high school teams, factory teams, things like that. They're all just sort of one of a kind things I've found in thrift stores or on eBay. Uh, but I don't, uh, I, my, like the Mets, the New York Mets baseball team, Mets are about as close as I get to religion. I don't own any, 
apparel. Like I don't own a Mets jersey. I don't own a Mets cap. That's just not Amen. how it's to me to express myself as a fan. Uh, I'm not knocking people who do that, but it's just it's not what I'm about. I, I I'm not interested in the retail aspect, the merchandise aspect. Uh, of the uniform world. I'm interested in what the players wear and I write about that and and that's really where my focus is. I, I, I care about what the players wear, but I'm not looking to dress like them myself. What would you say is the biggest oddity that you've seen in hockey? For me, it would be the Philadelphia Flyers wearing long pants. <laughs> yeah, the Cooperalls, the, the, the famous Cooperalls uh, <laughs> experiment. And it wasn't just the Flyers, the, uh, the Whalers did as well. And I believe there was one game, and I think only one game, when they played each other. <laughs> uh, when the Flyers and Whalers had a sort of, you know, Cooperalls versus Cooperalls game. Uh, and the Flyers have actually brought the Cooperalls back for pregame skates a few times. Uh, you know, as a throwback move, I I was always surprised, frankly, that hockey has stuck with the short pants and the long stockings. I, I love that look, but I am surprised that it's endured this long and that something like Cooper Alls hasn't come along as a more modern replacement. Uh, the the knock on Cooper Alls at the time was not that they looked funny or that they, you know, that there was a you know some stylistic problem with them, but rather that the material they were made for was so uh, slippery and slick that players, when they got knocked down, when they took a check, uh, they would slide into the boards really fast, like faster than they normally would. So wow! It was a, it, <laughs> and so they were getting injured. They were they were like sliding into the boards, you know, just with too much velocity and momentum. So that's basically a fabric problem, and we're talking forty years ago. You'd think they could, if they wanted to solve that problem, I'm sure they could come up with a different fabric, you know, with a little more tack to it or something like that, where that particular issue would not be an issue anymore. Um, but I think it's more at this point, it's it's sort of what you say, that people look back at that now as this sort of bizarre visual chapter in hockey history that uh, people sort of laugh at and... So I don't think anyone's going to bring it back, um, <laughs> except maybe, you know, for a one-off uh, throwback right. kind of situation. You got to think that it would be very uncomfortable for a goaltender to wear those long <laughs> pants, right? No way. Wouldn't work well, out. yeah, I think a goalie could get away with not doing it. You know, a lot of goalies, not every fan realizes this, some goalies don't bother with the socks. Mm. You know, they, and you can't tell because they got the leg guards on, right? Yeah. Uh, it's only if you get a rear view. And there are some goalies in history, and I can't think of which one's – uh, at this point, but there are certain goalies in hockey history who have never worn the socks and, and they wear the pants and then they've got, you know, their shin guards, their leg guards. And uh, and nobody cares, obviously, because it's, it's no one's going to tell them they're out of uniform or something like that. Uh, but, yeah, goal, goalies got to do what they got to do to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Uh, Paul, I did want to ask you about the future of hockey jerseys in regard to reverse retros, throwbacks, that kind of deal. We had a game, I want to say it was last night or the night before, where St. Louis and the Kings were wearing their throwbacks. And I like the St. Louis throwbacks. Roy does not because he doesn't like the red. Yeah, it doesn't make there. any sense. They didn't have red before then, <laughs> and they don't have red now. Why? Why? Yeah. Explain that to me. So, so this was our text conversation the other night. But I did want to just say, is that what's the future with that? Because we did the Panthers had some cool ones down here that we really liked. There have been some really neat ones that have been kind of put out over the last couple of years. Are there going to be any new stuff coming up in the future that we can look forward to? Well, I think there's two different things that you're bringing up there. First, there's the issue of throwbacks, like what the Blues just did. And I, I got to tell you, I love those Blues throwbacks. And I, and I agree. You. I'm, I'm uh, with you that the red doesn't really make sense. But I love the the angle, yeah. you know, the diagonal stripes uh, on the jersey. I love how that makes each uniform number on the back of the jersey sort of unique. They have to cut each number based on where it falls within that stripe pattern, uh, you know, for the length of the number. I I, I always like that that uniform. Um, so will we continue to see throwbacks now and then? I'm sure. Like, that's not going to go away in any sport. Fans like throwbacks. Teams like to do throwbacks. Uh, but then you also mentioned the reverse retro program. And I got to tell you, I love reverse retro. Uh, almost every sport has done some sort of special league-wide uniform program. We see it in baseball with City Connect. We saw it in the NFL with Color Rush. Uh, the NBA has its uh, City Editions. Um, all of those are sort of excuses to come up with wacky designs whereas the the uh reverse retro is a uniform program about uniforms like it draws upon 
the the team's uniform history re- instead of you know drawing upon its local city landmarks or or you know whatever they all the, the silly storytelling they they put into these city connect uniforms mm. uh, and so I loved reverse retro I thought a lot of the designs were really good some weren't as good but in general I thought reverse retro has been like good for the NHL good for uniforms. Um, but unfortunately, it is an Adidas program. It is specific to Adidas, and it will be going away uh, at the end of the season because Adidas is going away, as you guys, I'm sure, have discussed on the show. Uh, Adidas, yeah. uh, their their contract with the NHL is ending at the end of the season, and Fanatics is taking over, which everybody is kind yeah. of nervous about because Fanatics, has, this will be the first time that the Fanatics logo has appeared uh on an actual on ice or on field or on court as the sport may be uh uniform and so uh on the back of the nhl jersey where the adidas logo is now the fanatics logo is going to be there instead and and people are you know because fanatics doesn't have the greatest reputation for their their retail merchandise people are worried about what they're going to do to nhl uniforms and i believe the plan at least for the first season uh for the 20 2024 slash 25 is that they're going to keep using the Adidas template um, and that, you know, like so the dimples on the shoulders and all the things we're used to seeing about the cut on the fabric and all of that uh, with the Adidas uniforms. I believe, I'm not sure if that's been officially announced, but I believe that is the plan for the first season of, of the Fanatics contract. And, and this much I do know is that whatever Fanatics ends up doing, the uniforms, at least the on ice uniforms are going to be made by the same Canadian factory that's been making the uniforms when Adidas had the contract okay. and when Reebok had the contract before that. So the same people, like the literally the hands-on sewing and all that is going to be the same people at the same factory that's been making NHL uniforms all along. The question is what specs are going to, uh, they're going to be making them. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, is, is Fanatics going to change the specs in any way? And again, I, I believe for the first season, they are not changing the Adidas specs. Man, I'm still nervous, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> just see people I like getting it. their jerseys ripped off when they're in a fight because the quality is not as good as you're used to it so you know yeah. fingers crossed that it works out but <laughs> uh paul uh you also write about uh ice design uh and i do uh I, it comes up although i i really should give credit uh to the great website thefaceoff.net yeah. uh which I, I don't know if you've ever discussed that on the show or the guy who runs it uh it's this incredible archive of ice design uh, where, you know, he, he's got every, you know, not just NHL teams, but minor league teams, juniors, uh, he's got ice designs going back decades, uh, and the renderings on the site are excellent. They're, they're, you know, they're very realistic looking, uh, and they're meticulous. Uh, you know, if, if the, the checkerboard pattern on a red line changes just a teeny little bit, uh, from one season to another, he's got it. Like he'll get that down. Yeah. Uh, it's you know, ice design is definitely something that is part of the aesthetics of hockey for sure. Absolutely, I always noticed uh, the Flyers have the uh, the three lines going down the red, uh, the center line. Mm-hmm. Obviously, mm-hmm. then you got the diamonds and the flames. I believe they still have the uh, flame, uh, the flaming C in the on their line the, on the red line. Yeah. yeah, you know, red line design is something that's really changed a lot during my time writing about sports. It used to be just about every team just had the basic checkerboard kind of thing, and now uh, red line design has become sort of a way for a team to express itself a little. They can put their logo in there. They can alternate their primary and secondary logos. They can do three stripes, like you were saying with the Flyers. Uh, they, if they're celebrating an anniversary, you know, 25th anniversary or whatever it might be, they can put that logo in there. Um, and it's fun. It, it's sort of an interesting thing, even though the red line itself uh, is less important than it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, the hockey rules. Uh, no more two line passes on that one. Huh? <laughs> right. I would say uh, what would be the most annoying thing that you've noticed in a uniform design? Like for me, and this, this is a video game situation, like EA Sports' NHL franchise, uh, the Blackhawks uniform. Like the one I'm wearing right now. The shoulder patch is completely different. Let's see. Completely different from what they have in the game. It looks like what they have in like retail. Like just a regular old C as opposed to like this uh, wishbone type C. Like what is the <laughs> most annoying thing that you've noticed in a uniform? Well, uh, certainly the most annoying development from my perspective uh, in the NHL is the rise of advertising on the uniforms. Oh, yeah. Uh, both on the jersey and on the helmet. 
Uh, the helmet started during the pandemic and they were saying, oh, we're losing revenue because fans aren't in the arena. So we have to make up some of that lost revenue by letting uh, companies advertise on the helmets. It's just a temporary measure. And of course, it wasn't a temporary measure and um, <laughs> it became permanent and then it expanded. It's not just on the helmets, it's on the jerseys. And, you know, some of these teams like, you know, to see really to see any ad on a red like red wings like that classic uniform but my god they, their ad is from a waste disposal company like <laughs> literally garbage men on the jerk like it's ugh, it's it's just, i think it's sad i think it's really really sad i noticed in the uh the king's blues game on their helmet they had the american express logo on there except it was <laughs> black but they were in chrome helmets like it's barely noticeable like, uh, right. like that's annoying to me. Money well spent. Yeah, bro. Yeah, making money <laughs> is never temporary. You need that. Uh, I'm sorry, not you need that, but you need dashwatch.com. Paul is leaving the site May 26th, but the site's still going. May 26th yeah. is the anniversary of uniwatch.com. Paul, we really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. As you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. So thanks for having me.